Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I'm Peter Gross, co-host of the original Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler. For more than 50 years, Wild Kingdom explored wildlife and our natural world. Tonight's episode, and many others, focus on the timeless value of wildlife conservation. Wild Kingdom played a critical role in changing public attitudes about the importance of animals for the health of our planet and our own quality of life. We challenge viewers to learn about animals and get involved in conservation in their local communities. That call to action resulted in more visits to local zoos, nature preserves, and even observing animals in their natural habitats. And that connection with animals benefits all of us in the Wild Kingdom. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom right here on RFD TV. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom is presented by Mutual of Omaha, people you can count on. Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Often, man's use of land is not compatible with the wildlife living there. That's the case with the dingo, that highly intelligent wild dog of the Australian desert. Largest of that land's predators, the dingo is said to conflict with man's interests, especially where livestock is concerned. To better understand this conflict, Australia's Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization has conducted a seven-year research program learning everything possible about the dingo's behavior, physiology, and different habitats. I was invited to observe the research relating to desert habitat. It involved immobilizing dingoes with hypodermic darts shot from rifles and fitting them with telemetry collars. It was in the Australian outback, here, about 200 miles south of Alice Springs, that scientists were trying to ascertain what degree of compatibility might exist between man and the wild dogs of the desert. I'm flying toward a temporary camp in the outback with Dr. Brian Green who's conducting the dingo research program here in the desert habitat. Even though this is the rainy season, there's not much vegetation in the great Australian Simpson Desert. This is one of the few improved landing strips within a couple of hundred miles. From here, it is only a short distance to the research camp. We're met by Dr. Green's technical assistant, Ian McMillan, better known as Mac. He has almost everything in readiness for our move deeper into the outback in search of an adult male dingo to study. The bumper frame he's mounting will form a guardrail where Dr. Green can safely stand while we're moving. As soon as the animal's immobilized, it'll be fitted with a telemetry collar consisting of sophisticated components which will broadcast a continuous intermittent signal. It's a signal which can only be received for a short distance at ground level, but for many miles from an aircraft. The signal will come in strongest when the antenna is pointing directly at the source. Dr. Green will be doing the dingo darting using a rather unusual immobilizing rifle. The barrel is unscrewed and slides far forward in order to allow the hypodermic dart to be loaded. 
The dirt itself is filled with a proper dosage of the immobilizing agent known as M99. When loaded in the breech and the barrel reseated, this dart is fired by a gunpowder cartridge. Dr. Green now suggests, before we leave to dart the male dingo, that I look at the new litter of dingoes which they've been observing close by. They'll pick me up later as they set out in the truck to seek the dingo to be immobilized. We'll keep in touch with walkie-talkies so I'll know when they're ready to move out. One of the most commonly sighted wildlife species in the outback occurs in large flocks. They're parrot-like birds called galahs. They're extremely abundant. They're almost entirely seed eaters and sometimes become injurious to grain crops in other parts of Australia. The galah is also known as the rose-breasted cockatoo. It's not much farther to the rocky outcrop where I may be able to sight the dingo family. Just ahead is the spot, and sure enough, there's the mother dingo with her litter. They're very small, probably no more than a couple weeks old. Usually dingoes are yellowish brown in color, like this mother. But sometimes in the same litter there will also be white pups or dark brown ones. It's likely that Dr. Green is ready by now to pick me up. Max says they're on the way and that they'll be reaching my area in just another few moments. The area in which we'll be looking for the male dingo is several miles from here. The two researchers sighted the animal there a couple of times already. This will be their first attempt to dart it. The animal we're seeking is yellow, so he'll be difficult to sight against this desert background. High on the truck's platform, there's better visibility for scanning the terrain. It was just at this time of day that Dr. Green spotted the dingo before. Dr. Green has sighted the dingo about a half a mile from us, not yet aware that we're nearby. He's an alert animal, but is not alarmed because we're standing still. Now that we've located the male dingo we're after, we prepare for the darting. Ordinarily, the darted animal is not followed too closely. This time, however, Dr. Green wants to have the truck stay very close to the dingo after it's been darted so that he can observe its reaction to the immobilizing drug. The dart hits the dingo's side. We'll close the gap as quickly as possible so the animal's reaction to the drug can be studied.
the drug takes effect much more swiftly than Dr. Green anticipated. Generally, Dr. Green likes to stay reasonably close to the darted dingo, so when it drops, the exact location is known and the downed animal's not lost against the background of similar color. Before any tests are made, we will return the animal to the exact same spot where we first sighted it. Then, after the tests are completed and the antidote administered, it will recover its senses in terrain with which it is familiar. This is done so the animal will suffer minimal disorientation. At this place where we're stopping, we're in the same general area where the dingo was walking when we first sighted it. Now the processing of the animal can begin. Four closely related procedures will now be undertaken in order to determine how much the dingo eats and drinks during the next two weeks after we release it. These four procedures are taking a blood specimen as a control sample, giving him two different radioactive injections, and finally attaching the telemetry collar. Determining precisely how much food and water is consumed normally by the dingo allows the researchers to draw conclusions based on a thorough and total knowledge of dingo life history. One injection the dingo is being prepared for is radioactive sodium. This permits the scientists to determine how much meat was eaten. The second syringe injects radioactive heavy water called tritium. With the injection, a known level of radioactivity is established in the dingo's blood. This diminishes in accordance with how much the dingo drinks. Thus, we'll be able to determine the amount of water the dingo requires when we compare this blood sample with the one we'll take in two weeks from this same animal. While he's doing that, I'll make notation of the time and date. At the same time, Mac readies the telemetry collar. Later on, the signal coming from the telemetry collar will let us locate and immobilize this same animal again. Without it, the present testing couldn't be done. At least it couldn't be done on a dingo running wild, as this one soon will be again. And that's what's so necessary here to obtain accurate conclusions. With the processing of this dingo completed and the collar securely attached, we can prepare to administer the antidote which will nullify the effects of the immobilizing drug. Already the drug has begun to wear off a little, but the antidote will allow the dingo to swiftly and completely regain full control of its muscles and senses. The antidote works rapidly but to prevent any possibility of the dingo becoming overheated from lying in the direct sunlight, we cover him lightly with burlap. Now there's nothing left to do except to inject the antidote. Then we can step away a short distance and watch the results.
For a moment more, the dingo's quiet. And then the effects of the drug vanish with amazing speed. Fully recovered, the dingo is now free to roam throughout its usual territory until it's time to recapture it again. Two weeks later, we set out in an airplane to locate the dingo through the collar telemetry signal. This time to immobilize the animal again, finish the test and release it. Even though we're flying very low, visually it would be impossible to locate the dingo without the benefit of the telemetry receiver Dr. Green's activated. From above like this, the yellow dingo would be almost invisible even in the open. However, the telemetry collar signal has been accurately located with Dr. Green's antenna. Knowing where the dingo is, we can land and finish the remaining research procedure. In the truck again in late afternoon, we're within half a mile of the place where we pinpointed the dingo's location from above with the telemetry receiver. We won't approach any closer by vehicle, lest we alarm the animal. But Dr. Green will get another signal reading to point us in the right direction for our final approach on foot. If we alarmed the dingo, it would run, and a chase would be involved in order to immobilize it. This would be detrimental to the tests. Therefore, it's essential that we get very close in our approach on foot and get an immobilizing dart into it before it senses we're near. Once more, Dr. Green's locked in on the signal. And it's very strong now. Probably no more than a quarter mile from where we are. Dr. Green will continue to keep us on course with the telemetry receiver as we move through the brush and then at the crucial moment Mac will slip ahead and attempt to dart the animal. Dr. Green keeps one ear uncovered so he can hear his own sounds in walking and keep them at a minimum to prevent the dingo from becoming aware of us. The incoming signal indicates the dingo's very near, and Dr. Green whispers instructions for Mac to move on alone from here, so there'll be less chance of losing the element of surprise. shot is a good hit and the dingo's on the run. Already Max checking the dingo. As instructed by Dr. Green, he's making sure the animal's breathing is okay and he is in a comfortable position.
As soon as Dr. Green has removed the dart, he'll be able to take the blood sample. Later analysis of it will provide accurate information for the study. Little by little, the data being gathered by Dr. Green and Ian McMillan is providing a much clearer picture of the eating and drinking habits of Australia's largest predator than was ever available before. The telemetry unit is no longer needed, and we'll release the dingo without it this time when we're finished. Although the collar itself is now useless, the telemetry unit will be used again on other animals in the continuing research. The blood sample being taken now may provide evidence in the dingo's favor. Our work with this dingo is finished, and so now the antidote can be administered. It will only be a few moments before it will take effect. The final results of the present study may be the conclusion, after all the tests have been carefully evaluated, that efforts to exterminate the dingo could do far more harm than good. The work of scientists such as Dr. Green may go far in presenting the dingo in its true role as an important animal in the balance of nature in Australia. As the only predator of any consequence in this land of the outback, there's a definite place for this wild dog of the desert. Man has the unfortunate failing of often judging a whole species of animals too harshly because of the detrimental acts committed only by a few. The dingo may be one of those which is too hastily condemned. It's true, dingoes occasionally prey on domestic animals, but research shows the percentage of livestock in their diet is extremely small. It's significant that the tests also show the most common item of the dingo diet is rabbits, and these same rabbits are greatly detrimental to Australian agriculture. Only through continued careful research, which considers all factors, can the true value or detriment of the animal to man be known. Man must temper his judgments and not indict too hastily. He still has much to learn about the animals which inhabit the wild kingdom. Mutual of Omaha, people you can count on, has presented Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Mutual of Omaha, helping people find Medicare solutions for over 50 years. To learn more about plan options or how to protect your kingdom, contact us today. Mutual of Omaha, protect your kingdom.